In the first century, the ancient Greek historian Plutarch wrote, The affirmative mix of the ten axioms, 103,049 connections. Many mathematicians tried to decipher what Plutarch meant, but for a long time, none succeeded. In 1870, one of mathematical logic's top dogs, Ernst Schroeder, published a paper describing his latest discovery. Neither Schroeder nor his readers realised that the discovery wasn't new. The greatest astronomer of antiquity, Hipparchus, had found the same result 2,000 years earlier. Schroeder's discovery was in the field of combinatorics, the study of how things can be counted or arranged. If you were asked how many different three-letter words you can make with the first four letters of the alphabet, that would be a combinatorics question. To answer it correctly, you'd need some more specific information. So, here we add that. You may only use each letter once, and the words don't have to be in the dictionary. The answer is that you can make 24 words. Here they are. There are six beginning with A. With hardly any more work, you can say there will be four lots of six in total, because there are four possible first letters. Analogy does the rest. What we just did was a permutation calculation. More specifically, since we only used each letter once, it's an example of a permutation without repetition. This was straightforward, but for things like a Rubik's Cube, for example, things can get more complicated. Returning to letters, let's say you were asked how many six-letter words you could make from all 26 letters of the alphabet. Writing out all the possibilities now would take a long time. That's where the formula for this type of calculation comes in handy. It's n factorial divided by n minus r factorial, where n is how many things we have to choose from, and r is how many we've to choose. We can easily confirm the formula gives an answer of 24 when we calculate how many three-letter words can be made with four letters. The more challenging example of six letter words with all 26 letters to choose from gives us over 165 million possible arrangements. It's just as well we didn't try to figure out the answer by writing down all the possibilities this time. Schroeder's discovery was a way of counting a particular arrangement of objects. The numbers in his combinatorics paper from 1870 grow quickly as the inputs grow, just as we saw in the permutations examples. Hipparchus must have seen the same thing, but it doesn't seem to have phased him, despite the clumsiness of the ancient Greek numbering system. To see what Schroeder's numbers, they're actually called his little numbers, to see what they tell us about arranging objects, we can show them in the form of branching trees. We look at whole numbers beginning at n equals 1. For every whole number n, we ask, how many different arrangements of n branches can we get? For one branch, only one arrangement is possible, so the Schroeder number for one branch is 1. For two branches, again only one arrangement is possible, so the Schroeder number for n equals 2 is 1. For three branches, three arrangements yield three endpoints. For four branches, eleven arrangements lead to four endpoints, so for n equals 4, the Schroeder number is 11. And for five branches, five endpoints can be reached in 45 different ways, so the Schroeder number is 45. <laughs> Yes, it's time to stop and change course. Drawing these arrangements is becoming too time-consuming. Instead, we can use a recurrence relation to generate Schroeder's little numbers more easily. Clearly, we can't use it for n equals 1 or 2, but we've already seen that these Schroeder numbers are both equal to 1 anyway. Here's the recurrence relation again. We'll use an input of n equals 4 to calculate the fourth Schroeder number. It's a recurrence relation because we use the previous two Schroeder numbers to calculate the next. After a little arithmetic, it outputs the fourth Schroeder number, 11, as expected. Calculating up to n equals 15 shows that Schroeder's little numbers soon become very large indeed. So where does Hipparchus come in? He comes in here, at the tenth Schroeder number. I mentioned near the start that Schroeder was one of mathematical logic's top dogs. One of the top dogs of combinatorics is MIT's Richard Stanley. He wrote the definitive textbook, Enumerative Combinatorics. In the first volume, he included an intriguing statement from the ancient Greek historian Plutarch. Stanley was aware that for a long time Plutarch's words had stymied many of mathematics' most eminent historians. 
He was intrigued enough by Plutarch's numbers to pose the problem as an exercise in his combinatorics textbook to see if anyone else could see what was meant. In January 1994, David Hoff, a graduate student at George Washington University, was working through the exercises in Stanley's book. Hoff was 44 years old and had just two years previously decided to become a mathematician. It was he who finally connected Plutarch, and therefore Hipparchus, with the tenth Schroeder number. How did Hipparchus calculate the numbers? When Schroeder tried it, he tells us he wasn't able to achieve a general solution. He did, however, calculate the first ten numbers from the equations he derived and wrote in 10 part 2 of his paper. We can't give a definite answer to the question of how Hipparchus calculated the numbers. He might, as a first step, have visualised the problem as one of branching trees. But it doesn't seem likely that he went as high as the tenth number by drawing 103,049 arrangements of a ten-branched tree. He might have considered arrangements of parentheses around letters, which is another way of looking at the Schroeder Hipparchus numbers. Or he might even have been thinking geometrically about non-intersecting diagonals on polygons, which is yet another way of looking at the numbers. Regardless of how he visualised the problem, it's likely that he used a recursive argument to solve it. Like the recurrence relation we saw earlier, he almost certainly used the calculations he'd made for smaller numbers to obtain larger numbers. If you want to see a little speculation about how Hipparchus might have calculated his result, I've added it at the end of the video. What about the question of whether Hipparchus or Chrysippus was right? The question, remember, was how many connections could be made between ten axioms. Chrysippus was one of ancient Greece's great thinkers. His reputation was finally restored in the 20th century. It was only then that advances in propositional logic revealed that his original work, previously dismissed, had been right all along. Chrysippus was head of Athens' school of Stoic philosophy. His contributions to intellectual life were formidable, and he is regarded as one of the greatest logicians in history. It's well known that ancient Greek mathematics was handicapped by its failure to recognise zero as a number. Less well known is the fact that most ancient Greek intellectuals also didn't acknowledge one as a number. Chrysippus told them they were wrong, and insisted that one was a true number. Although Hipparchus got his mathematics right, the logician Suzanne Bobzine thinks he misinterpreted Chrysippus' stoic logic. She hypothesises that Hipparchus gained his outlook on logic, including stoic logic, via works or teachers of peripatetic heritage or influence. The peripatetics and stoics didn't always see eye to eye on questions of logic. Professor Bobzine believes her hypothesis explains why Hipparchus calculated that 10 axioms led to 103,049 arrangements, while Chrysippus thought it was many more. One of the links below is a link to her paper. Thanks to the inquisitiveness of Richard Stanley and the perception of David Hoff, we've been granted a fleeting glimpse of ancient Greek combinatorics, a field whose sophistication went far beyond anything historians of mathematics had previously imagined. By counting up something like branched trees or letters and parentheses, Hipparchus may have generated up to say the sixth Schroeder number. He may then have done some experimental mathematics looking for a pattern in the sequence of numbers he degenerated. He would have played with rules trying to find a rule that generated the next number from preceding numbers. After some time he could have seen a pattern developing like this one. We notice here that for s of 2, s of 3 and s of 4 we are actually generating numbers double the desired outcome, but that's easily dealt with any time. We'll now add another line for s of 5 to our calculation. Notice the patterns. The entry in this column is invariably s of n minus 1. This column is always s of 1 times s of n minus 1. The next column is s of 2 times s of n minus 2. Let's now use the pattern we are seeing to find s of 6. We get 394, which is double the Schroeder Hipparchus number 197, which, depending on our staying power, may or may not have been the last we ventured to arrive at with diagrams. 
we now have a clear pattern allowing us to calculate as many Schroeder Hipparchus numbers as we wish to. The pattern is clear from each term of the sums. In orange above the sums you can see the general terms. Let's see if we can repeat the patterns and calculate the seventh Schroeder Hipparchus number. We write down the terms. We sum their values and we get 1806. We take a half of this to get 903, which is indeed the seventh Schroeder Hipparchus number. The numbers on the right are known as the big Schroeder numbers. They can be used to count the number of paths through a lattice. Clearly, there are patterns in the summation for each term of the Schroeder-Hipparchus sequence that I've not mentioned, but I'll leave these for you to explore.